Well, I think everyone needs to get ready for an amazing presentation from Natalie Panic. As I said before, Natalie is a robotic operator and aerospace engineer at MDA Space Missions, previously interning at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and NASA's Ames Research Center. She has driven a solar-powered car across North America, has a pilot's license, and even skydived with, with Korea's first astronaut. See, I told you you were a rocket scientist. <laughs> with degrees in mechanical and aerospace engineering, Natalie has co-authored papers on micro, microgravity combustion and on-orbit satellite servicing. Natalie is an advocate for women in technology and encouraging women to dive head-on into challenging careers. She is also the recipient of the 2013 University of Calgary Graduate of the Last Decade Award and the 2013 McGill Northern Lights Award as a rising star in aerospace. We are very proud to acknowledge New Alto's sponsorship of Miss Panic's talk. New Alto's core business is reducing the environmental impact of industrial waste and they've been a, le a leader in that field for more than 20 years. Please help me welcome Alice Chung, General Manager with the Oil Recycling Group at New Alta, to the podium to welcome Natalie. I need glasses these days. Um, thank you. Well, New Alta is the headquartered in Calgary, and we trade on the TSX. We've been in, um, in the oil recycling, I'm sorry, in the waste business since 1993. We provide innovative, engineered environmental solutions that enable customers to reduce disposal, enhance recycling, recover valuable resources from industrial waste. We serve customers on site directly at their operations and through a network of 85 locations across Canada and the U.S. with a focus of minimizing waste and recovering products. Our sustainability focus is resonating with customers and is increasing important to many of our investors as a way for them to participate in the sustainability market. Last year we recovered two million barrels of oil from oil and gas exploration, drilling, production, and refining waste, and we don't even own a single oil well. 72,000 tons of lead from spent um, car batteries, 23 million liters of base oil and lubricants from the used oil, and this equates to about $400 million worth of products annually. New Alta is in the sustainability business. We understand that investment in sustainability is an investment in our future. Speaking of the future, I'd like to welcome Natalie Panic, our speaker, Women Defining the Future Luncheon. And as you notice, we've got rockets on the uh, table <laughs> in honor of you. <laughs> Rocket candy, that is. <laughs> Uh, is the microphone working? Okay, I'm gonna stay down here for this talk. I hope everyone can see me and hear me at the back. I am so appreciative of opportunities to come home to Calgary because I adore this city. So thank you very much for having me here today at this expo for such an inspiring event. I'm sure all of you in this room here can understand when I say that when I went through my engineering undergraduate degree, I spent the majority of my time running back and forth between my lectures and labs, doing my assignments, studying for exams, going back and doing more assignments, writing up my labs, and any free time that I had, I wanted to be outdoors, in nature, hiking, camping, backpacking, climbing. The last thing I wanted to be doing was reading a book. I don't think during my entire undergraduate degree I read anything other than my textbooks. But now that I'm out of school and working, I love to read. And my friends joke that I can be found in the what every man should have section of the bookstore. Have any of you seen those chapters? They're indigo, they have every man tells a story and these sections where they have books that are supposed to be applicable to men, but they're the sections that I love because I can find stories of space travel and epic mountaineering expeditions and other adventures. And one of my favorites is called Failure is Not an Option by NASA flight director Gene Kranz. And this is his stories during the Gemini, Mercury, and Apollo era of space travel, where NASA had this remarkable goal of trying to send humans to the moon. And when I first got this book, and usually when I get any book, I read the preface to try and get a feel for the story. I flip to the middle of the book because sometimes it has the insert with the pictures so I can get a feel for the characters. And then for some reason with this book, I went all the way to the end. And on one single page, there was something called the Foundations of Mission Control. 
And these were simple foundations or attributes that flight director Gene Kranz expected his team of engineers and scientists to have in order to make sure that those men got to the moon safely and got home safely as well. And these were things like toughness, competence, discipline, responsibility, and courage. And as I read this book, I kept these foundations in my mind, how this was applied to the engineering projects that they were working on. And as I've gone through my life, I've also kept these foundations in the back of my mind. And I think they're really what has helped me pursue a career in aerospace engineering and fall in love with technology. And I mentioned these foundations when I gave a keynote back in May at the university. And then I also got to thinking, if I were to have my own foundations, what would they be? Values that I want to live by to make sure that I find success in my life. And I came up with things like perseverance, being able to adapt to change, having perspective, lifelong learning, and the power of mentoring. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about those things today. And the first being perseverance. As I've gone through my life, and. I, I was being creative <laughs> when I was making these slides, so I decided to freeform some of the words. But one of the big things for me was making my own opportunities as I went along my way, setting goals for myself and making sure I did everything in my power to achieve those goals. Unfortunately, opportunities aren't gonna come to you on a silver platter. You have to go out of your way to make them happen. And the story I'm gonna tell, I don't tell very often because it's an example of how I failed, and I failed multiple times. But now when I look back on it, I realize that there was a deeper lesson in that, and that persistence and perseverance really does pay off when you're trying to make your dreams come true. So as you all know, being out west, the majority of the industry is oil and gas related. There aren't many opportunities to explore space opportunities. So I was constantly on the internet looking for exchange programs or opportunities to go down and work at NASA. And I just stumbled across one called the Space Exploration Scholarship that the Canadian Space Agency offered to send one Canadian down to a NASA internship called the NASA Academy. And it was like an elite summer program for students to go and hear lectures, work with the principal investigator on some science project at NASA, take field trips to companies like Laurel Space Systems, which manufacture satellites. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to go down here. So I applied to this program, keeping in mind that I probably didn't have a good chance because I didn't really have any space experience at all. So I applied, waited about three months for the application process to go through, was waiting for that email, and I got that dreadful rejection letter. Thank you for taking the time to apply to our program, but unfortunately, you have not been selected. It's like, oh man, I wanted so bad to go down there. So then the second year came along, and I had gone to the website around the same time you apply, and it said space exploration, scholarship temporarily suspended. I thought, really? Like, this is such a great opportunity. They're only sending one Canadian down to this program, and they're suspending it for this year. So I did, what I did was decided to email anybody I could think of at NASA, and then anybody I could think of at the Canadian Space Agency, and try to facilitate some sort of exchange program on my own. But in the end, I ended up hitting a brick wall, and I just couldn't make any opportunity materialize that summer. So the following year, I was still el eligible for the program, and I thought, okay, third time's the charm, I'm gonna apply for this program again. I had more experience under my belt because I was further through my degree. I had participated on the university solar car project, and I applied, waited three months to hear, hear back, and I got that email saying, thank you for taking the time to apply, but unfortunately, you have not been selected for the program. And I was just devastated at this point. So after, regrouping and gathering my thoughts, I decided I was just going to call the Canadian Space Agency and just get feedback on my application and try and figure out why I hadn't been selected. So I did that, ended up talking to someone. They said I had finished in the top two and gave me some good encouragement for what to do in the next year. So the fourth time, this is the last year I'm eligible to apply for this program, I applied. I thought, okay, I really have a good chance now. I was second last year, for sure they're going to take me. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, maybe they'll at least feel sorry for me for having <laughs> applied four times. So I applied, was really positive, was waiting for this rejection letter, or the, the letter, and then I got it again. Thank you for taking the time to apply. Unfortunately, you have not been selected for the program. I think I burst into tears on the spot. Like, I just didn't know what to do. I had been trying so hard to get down there. And so I had talked to my parents and some other people, and they said, well, why don't you just call NASA this time? and see, see what you can do. So I had prepared this big speech because I figured I was just gonna get a voicemail. I dug up the number for the Director of Higher Education at NASA Goddard, got on the phone, made the call, and someone picked up on the other end. 
and within two minutes I had been offered a position down at NASA Goddard to intern for that summer. So after four times and having to call someone on the phone, I made my own way there. Unfortunately, I still had to find $10,000 to, <laughs> to fund the program, and after two months of searching, the Ontario Centers of Excellence awarded me an international scholarship for young talent, so I was able to go down and participate in the program. And if you believe, after all of that, I was at Toronto International Airport, uh, ready to get on my flight. When you're working for NASA as a professional engineer, you can apply for a TN visa, which you can get when you get to the airport and you go through customs. So I had all my paperwork in order, get to the border control agent. He sends me off to a little room. I'm thinking, OK, this is exactly what happens when you're getting this visa. I sat for a couple hours in that room. I was finally called up to the till with an agent, and he asked for my plane ticket, and then he took a big black marker and put an X through it and said, you have the wrong visa. You can't go down to NASA. <laughs> It was sheer terror. I didn't know what to do. It was like little old me and all these customs agents. But after six hours of sorting out the details and phone calls, I was on that plane down to Nasser Goddard, where I was mentored by a physicist who came from a Nobel Prize winning lineage of physicists. I was there when the Solar Dynamic Observatory and the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter were being assembled in their clean room. So I got to put on the bunny suits, those white suits with the feet and the, the face shield and the gloves, and interact with that hardware. And it was literally the summer of my dreams. I felt like I was winning my dream job, except that I didn't win it. For every hour I spent down there, I spent an hour trying to get myself there. And in some ways, that was what made the summer so rewarding. So I can't say enough about creating your own opportunities for yourself and surrounding yourself with the people and resources that will help you live a life full of peak moments. And when I say a peak moment, I mean a time in your life when you're really challenged and you feel like you're you're at your best and you're successful in learning. Uh, in Toronto, there's an organization called the Women's Executive Network, and Janet Holder mentioned it this morning, how she had won a top 100 award for them. But their goal is to inspire smart women to lead. And they offer mentoring programs. Uh, they actually have programs now to help get more women on boards, and they have lecture series. So I was fortunate enough to be a participant in one of their mentoring programs, and I was mentored by Marie Carmichael, who is the only female pilot and commander of the Canadian Snowbirds, which is the aerobatic uh, flight team that performs in air shows all over the world. And in addition to being mentored one-on-one -on -one with her, you got to go and sit in on these workshops throughout the year. And one of the workshops was a feed-forward session. And at this session, the lady who was facilitating the workshop put these questions up on the screen. She said, what was a time in your life when you felt at your peak, at your best, and what were the conditions that created that? Would you consider this one of your peak moments? Are you moving towards those conditions, or are you moving away from those conditions? And if you're moving away from them, how do you get yourself back there? So when we were doing this assignment, we paired up with other people in the program, and they, the role of the person you were partnered with was just to sit there and listen. And you were to talk about what your peak moment was and go through each of these questions. So I had to think for a long time about what mine was. And then I came up with a time the following summer after Goddard where I was interning at NASA Ames Research Center working on a mission to Mars. So the idea was to have crew members on this Mars mission travel to the surface but then live underneath in the lava tubes, lava tubes and caves that are there instead of having them set up a life support system on the surface. And so we were doing all this research to put this proposal together and present it to the NASA Mission Explorations Directorate. And so as we were doing the, this work, I was selected to be one of the editors for the report. And I had been working on a lot of the technical sections for it and kind of putting off the introduction because I didn't know what to say to inspire this committee to want to undertake this proposal, to get them excited like Kennedy had got the whole world excited about sending a man to the moon in the 60s. So after some time, I had written some thoughts down, put something together, and as we were writing these reports and doing our research on this group project for this Mars mission, you were able to submit some of your work to advisors that NASA had hired to read over all of our work and provide feedback. So I submit this introduction, and I thought I was just going to get technical comments back, but instead written in pencil, and I had submitted it to an advisor, his name was Jim. He had been working with NASA since the 60s when they actually sent the men to the moon. And his feedback was incredible because he said he hadn't been inspired like that since the Apollo era in the 60s. And it actually brought him to tears to read the introduction. 
And in that moment, as I was reading those comments, I felt like that was my peak moment. Like if I surrounded myself with these dynamic peers at this location, this NASA Ames Research Center with all these resources, that we could change the face of space and foster the international relationships that would make future exploration possible. That was one of my peak moments. And what provides a better experience than living in a dorm on NASA Ames Research Center, 50 feet from this old abandoned McDonald's with this skeleton crossbone, skull and crossbones flag in the window, where they're processing decades old footage from the moon that no one in the world has seen yet. The Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project is taking all these film reels and processing the data so we can actually see this moon footage. And I'm 50 feet from this, literally can take two minute walk and see all this film footage from the moon that no one in the world has seen yet. Or skydiving with Korea's first astronaut who is also a woman, or building radios to listen for lightning in a field. Like I never in my wildest dreams imagined I'd be listening for lightning in Palo Alto, California. So the idea of recognizing opportunities in your life that you have felt successful and challenged is about feeding forward into future opportunities and growth. Feeding forward hones into the vast amount of future possibilities based on times that you were most happy and conditions that make you feel at your best. We cannot change the past, but we can shape the future. Recognizing our goals and the resources needed to achieve them, recognizing opportunities when presented to us, and seizing them. And a lot of that comes with having the right perspective. There is incredible value to the insight that perspective can bring. It fosters objectivity, which ultimately gives way to progress, and that's especially important when you're working on team projects. It allows you to follow as well as lead, to sell your own vision, but also to sit back and listen to and support the dreams of others. So after my third year of engineering at the University of Calgary, they were starting something called the Solar Car Project. So there's an organization called the North American Solar Challenge, which organizes a race every year for these solar-powered cars to travel across the country. And for some reason in 2005, they decided that they were going to finish the race in Calgary. So you'd start in Austin, Texas, drive all the way north to Winnipeg, and then drive west across to Calgary. So the president of the University of Calgary decided that they couldn't have this race finish here and not enter our own car in the race. So we had nine months to design and build a solar-powered car that could pass all the scrutineering tests, tests and be able to drive on a highway to participate in this race. So essentially, it was a car that had uh, an array of solar panels on the top. That ener any energy that was gained from the sun was stored in the lithium ion batteries at the front of the car. And then that was used to power a motor that was in the rear wheel. And this car only had three wheels. And for the three years that I participated on this project, I learned the ins and outs of teamwork. That camaraderie and support that can develop when people are working towards a common goal, but also the frustration and anger that can sometimes arise when people are overworked and success isn't immediate. But it's about realizing that success comes from the strengths of individuals, but also the communal efforts of a team. And we certainly wouldn't have started a legacy of solar-powered cars without working together as a team. I don't know if anyone's seen this year's university solar car. Anybody? So it looks nothing like this. It actually has room for passengers and trunk space, and the driver would be sitting more upright. So it was about pushing energy innovation and seeing what we could do with solar power. And that's really come a long way in the last decade, which is really neat. I like showing this picture because not many people can say they drove an experimental test vehicle across the border from the US into Canada with a customs agent asking for your passport knocking at the window. <laughs> <laughs> it was moments like these and also this where we crossed the finish line to 10,000 people at the university where you really realize to appreciate your opportunities and opportunities to work as a team. Uh, I worked on the aerodynamic shell, so the, the airfoil wing that you see there, but I also trained to be a driver. So for two years, I did fitness training and other training and safety training to be able to drive this car. And there were many people who were vying for this opportunity to drive the car, most of them men. But it was only because the project engineer decided to take a chance on me that I had the opportunity to race with only a handful of people across North America. So in the end, Having perspective and working in the team is about respecting and utilizing the abilities of others, realizing that we all work together towards a common goal. So whether it was working at NASA Goddard or working at NASA Ames or building a solar-powered car, 
I really learned that you have to be able to adapt to change. You have to be able to survive uncomfortable situations and unfamiliar situations, embrace them, and learn to thrive in them. We aren't defined by our experiences, but the attitudes we choose to adopt and how we react to those experiences. So if you can, transform any tension into innovation, tackle challenge with an open mind, and really just be willing to take risks. And my first job at MDA Space Missions was the definition of diving into an uncomfortable and unfamiliar situation. So just a little bit of background. MDA is the company that built the Canada Arm, the Canada Arm 2, and the Dexter robot on Space Station. So this is the Canada Arm 2 here. That's the long arm for those of you on the other side of the room. That's on the left side of the screen and then also the Dexter robot. So each of these robots has seven joints, or seven degrees of freedom. So just like your arm and my arm, it has a wrist that can pitch, yaw, and roll. It has an elbow that can pitch, and then it has a shoulder that can pitch, and also yaw back and forth. So when I was hired at MDA, I was hired onto a project called the Next Generation Canada Arm. And the goal of this project was to build robotic manipulators that could be sent up on some sort of launch vehicle dock with a broken down spacecraft and then deploy these robotic arms to fix broken parts or pump fuel and oxidizer into those broken down spacecraft. And it's a really interesting concept because if you think about it, everything in our daily lives that we use routinely is serviced. If something is wrong with our roads or our transmission lines or anything else, there's crews here on Earth that are able to deploy and go fix them so that we have our services up and running again. But something that we rely on 24 hours a day, seven days a week for our internet, for our TV, for our cell phones, is satellites. And when they break down, there's nothing you can do about it. They just become space junk. So this program was all about being a catalyst for this new era of sustainable satellite servicing and trying to be more aware of what we're putting into space and being able to fix these space assets instead of letting them become space junk. So as we went through the program, we built a bunch of test beds at our facility in Brampton, one of which you see here. This is the small Canada arm. So this has six joints, and it was supposed to do tasks like uh, refueling a spacecraft. So along that arm, you can see cables running, and that's where the fuel and oxidizer would flow from a service or spacecraft into those six fill drain valves that are there. So you can see the end of that robot is hovering over some valves. So it's just like if you're putting gas in your car, this robot would be pumping <coughs> gas or fuel into the satellite. And then some of the other tasks it had to do were removing thermal blankets. So all the satellites in space, because of the extreme weather conditions, have thermal blankets that protect it from the environment. And then also cutting a little tiny piece of lock wire. So on the right side of that screen, if, can you all see that little tiny piece of lock wire that's on one of the valves? <laughs> So an operator on Earth would have to command this robot in space to cut that two thou thick piece of lock wire. So imagine this. Imagine you're sitting in a room, and in front of you is a piece of dental floss about an inch long strung between two posts. You're blindfolded, and you're wearing a GoPro head camera. And you also have one of those tiny pairs of manicuring scissors. And there's someone in a room next to you who's looking at a laptop, looking at the feed from your GoPro camera. And they're trying to tell you where to put your scissors to cut that piece of dental floss. How many of you think you could do that on the first try? And that's essentially what these robotic operators on ground would have to do. And they'd only have one chance to cut that piece of wire, because otherwise you're most likely going to collide with the spacecraft and damage million, multi-million dollar hardware. And when you're trying to go into space to fix the client's hardware, it's probably not a good idea to go and break it when you're trying to do that. So, for the, the three years that I worked on this project, I was hired right out of my master's degree. I did an undergrad in mechanical engineering. I studied combustion and microgravity, and I had absolutely no experience in robotics. And they hired me as the only operations engineer. So essentially, I was taking the designs that the mechanical engineers and the designers came up with for these robotic parts and making sure that they could do what the missions were that the Canadian Space Agency had specified for us. So, Another way to think of it is doing mission planning for this robotic arm. So say you were doing an oil change on your car, which is the analogy I'm going to use because I just changed my oil last week. But when you're going to change your oil, you have to plan what you're going to do and plan how your arms are going to move. You have to get your oil pan, put it under the car, drain all your oil. You have to get your filter, and for some reason in my car, my filter is mounted sideways, so I have to turn my wheels all the way left so I can come and get that filter through the wheel well. And then you replace your filter, and put in the new oil. So when you're doing that, you have to make sure you know where your arms are so you're not going to collide with any components. 
And it's the exact same thing when you're planning for a robotic mission. I have to make sure I know where these robotic arms are moving so that they don't collide with hardware. And I have to make sure that this arm can get to the fill drain valves. And so in those moments when I'm trying to do these experiences where I have no experience, I don't know what I'm doing, you either learn to sink or swim. I can choose to be entirely stressed out for the three years of this project, not knowing what I'm doing, or I can learn to embrace the situation, ask for help when I need it, admit when I don't know what I'm doing, and find a support system to help me in my roles. And that's the best thing you can do, is when life presents you with challenges, plan a course of action to battle through it. There's a saying that goes, stormy seas make for skillful sailors. And to me, that means if you can weather out the storm, eventually you'll find success. So don't be afraid to throw yourself into unfamiliar situations and just dive head on into a challenging task. So throughout all of these experiences, one of the common themes that I've had through my mentors and my supervisors was the idea of lifelong learning and learning how to balance trade-offs. As engineers, you all know that when you're working on a project, you're trading off between risk, you're trading off between cost, money, uh, efficiency, robustness. And in the end, all of that works together, balancing to, to uh, complete a successful project. So for me, I got my pilot's license when I was in school, and I had to trade off whether I wanted to spend $10,000 of my money and come out with a pilot's license or not. And then also when I was going through getting my pilot's license, you're constantly trading off uh, a time balance. Do I have enough time to learn everything I need to know to use this complex system by myself? Or a Mars mission is a perfect example of understanding how to balance trade-offs. It starts with whether you're going to send humans to Mars or whether you're going to send robots to Mars. If you're going to send humans, you get that first-hand knowledge, that perception that only humans are able to provide but you might be sending them on a one-way mission where they're exposed to more radiation in that trip than they would be in their entire life on Earth. So then you think, well, maybe I should be sending robots to Mars. But then if you send robots, you only have a limited perspective because to see what the robot sees, you need cameras. But then there's a delay in transmission between the footage that you're getting from Mars and what you're getting back here on Earth. So a successful engineer will always evaluate trade-offs and learn how to balance them. That doesn't mean you're giving up on a dream or the will to enable it. It just means you're being prepared enough to make your own dreams a reality. So the better you are at balancing trade-offs, I think the more su successful your project will be in the end. And I just want to finish off today talking about the power of mentoring. As I was going through my undergraduate degree, my master's or getting my pilot's license, I was always looking for females that I could look up to, that I could model my career after. And in engineering, there just aren't that many. Um, usually, now at work, I'm the only woman in the clean room working on these robots, or I'm the only woman in a boardroom or going through design reviews. And I've learned more than anything the power of courage, believing in myself and others, mastering hesitation and self-doubt to succeed. So I gave a TED talk last year, and I did a little bit of an experiment with the audience when I was giving this talk because the idea was about revolutionizing women in technology. So I had everyone standing, and then I was going to say a few names. And if they knew the person that I said, they were to stay standing. And if they didn't know the person, they were to sit down. So I started off with names like Kim Kardashian and Heidi Klum. And everybody in the audience knew who they were, of course, and were cheering for them. How ma just out of curiosity, how many of you in here know who they are? OK, so then I moved on to Marissa Meyer. Anybody in here know who she is? Really? That's it? OK, we'll try that again. Everyone in here know who knows Marissa Meyer? Lift your hand. OK, I'm totally shocked because I was giving my talk to a room full of high school and university students, and more of them knew who she was than you do. And she is the CEO of Yahoo. And beyond that, she has a background in artificial intelligence. She is one of the most prevalent women in technology in the world right now. Um, OK, so then I moved on to people like Lena Gade and Melissa Pemberton and Sarah McNair Landry. Anybody? No, so these are race engineers, <laughs> acrobatic pilots, and National Geographic adventures. And for some reason, everybody knows who the reality TV stars are, but they don't know who these women are, who I'm inspired by, and who all you should be inspired by. We should have this community of these inspiring women that the next generation of women have easy access to so that they can learn from their careers and learn how to fall in love with technology and interact with technology. 
And a community is a powerful concept in terms of the next generation of innovation. The next generation of leaders and visionaries are going to be leading a movement, and they're going to need support from a community while they're traversing en route to their ultimate goals and dreams. And I think women are very good at building networks and communities, and that will be indicative of a very powerful shift in innovation and technology over the next few decades, because those who can build networks and support systems will ultimately find success. I'm a big believer in that we need to be using social media and all forms of the media to start showcasing women in technology, women in science, engineering, math, and just providing better access to these female mentors. I know a lot of you in here have asked today, how can you find mentors? How can you find sponsors? But mentoring is too directional. So as you go through finding your own mentors and sponsors, also think that you can be mentoring the next generation of women because I'm sure all of you have a ton of experiences that you can also be sharing. And these women need to understand that they can be catalysts for change, that they can revolutionize the world through technology, that they can be strong, and that they can be leaders. So thank you very much for having me here today.